so yesterday, I'm going to continue where I left off yesterday. Um, so I was describing the example uh, of our uh, uh, more read or Fapian state. And um, let me see here. So in the conformal field theory construction, we can obtain this by taking psi to be the uh, Majorana field with this usual uh, correlator and expanding using Wick's theorem, and we obtain the Fafian. And I also said that there's a spin field in this theory, which is chiral, um, such that uh, the operator product of psi with sigma has a one over square root of z. Uh, am I too loud? I feel like I can hear myself rather loudly. Um, another way to say this is that if I kind of drag or analytically continue the field psi around sigma, it changes sign. Okay, so this acts like a vortex. And putting this into the construction, using this in the uh, quasi-hole field, uh, for example, with two quasi-holes, we get functions like this. And um, if you look at this for a while, you can sort of see that W1 and W2 are like uh, vortices um, in some sort of average sense. Okay. Now, what happens when we go to more than two quasi-holes is more complicated. Um, it is actually possible to write explicitly the wave functions insofar as their z-dependence is concerned. Um, we have explicit functions for that. And it turns out that we can, we can construct these. Um, they're all... Uh, conformal blocks, and the number of these is 2 to the n over 2 minus 1. If we fix the boundary conditions and we fix uh, big N to be even. Um, and so we have, so here we have the multiplicity of quasi-hole states that I was talking about yesterday. And so you see here, a little n is the number of quasi-holes, so you see what we have is square root 2 states per quasi-hole, essentially. So this number of states is less than two. So it cannot possibly be the case that this is due to some degree of freedom, local degree of freedom, sitting on each quasi-hole, because that can only possibly give us an integer to the power n, whereas what we have here is square root two to the power n. So this uh, sort of tells us directly that, um, that as long as all the quasi-holes are on the same footing, <coughs> at least, that the information stored in the state about which state we're in um, must be stored non-locally. So this is the real point about, about these functions. And why does this arise from the CFT? That's a little complicated if you haven't seen much CFT before, because you may think that I just put a field tau into my correlator, so I should just get a function, right? It's just an operator, it's a field operator, I put it in, I calculate it, I just get one function. Why do I get so many functions? Well, the reason is that this operator sigma of w, which is referred to as a chiral vertex operator, is not quite an ordinary operator, and it does some slightly funny and complicated things when you use it in a correlator. So it's a little formal to say that this is just a field operator because it does some slightly strange non-local things, and with the result that we have uh, a, a number bigger than one of distinct conformal blocks that arise. All right. So I'm not going to go too far into this type of thing. Let me just show how to get the multiplicity of states using the fusion rules. So for this particular case, um, if I take Q is 1 to make it simple, there are three quasi-particle types, which uh, I shouldn't really be calling these psi and sigma. I should have different symbols, but I'm going to use these anyway because they're rather conventional. Um, you see, these are really one psi and sigma with some um, e to the i phi type of factor at, uh, multiplied in, but I'll use these symbols anyway. And in fact, the charges of these are respectively 0, 0, and 1 half, modulo 1 in this case, okay? So there are these three distinct types of quasiparticles, and because the charge sector is abelian, 
Um, the fusion rules, and because we have Q is one, the fusion rules for these are the same as in the underlying Ising theory, in fact. So here they are, they're quite famous fusion rules by now. And the important one is the last one, sigma times sigma is one plus psi. So if we use this uh, in this uh, ring, we can, we're free to multiply and uh, use the distributive law because we have a ring. Um, so we can multiply some of these repeatedly and work out what we get. If we have four, for example, then we get two times one plus two times psi. And, um, and so, so finally, if big N is an even number, uh, mm, well, we sort of have a boundary condition that we have to end up with the identity field because that's sort of what the have at, uh, have at infinity. So we have to take the coefficient of the identity term. And so in this example, we get two. And doing the same calculation in the general case, we get two to the little n over two minus one. Okay. And so the whole thing came from the strange properties of this chiral vertex operator sigma, which has this, has two terms on the right-hand side. So you remember that I said that we get non-abelian statistics when some of the fields have um, more than one non-zero term on the right-hand side, that the sum over gamma of n alpha beta gamma is bigger than one. So that's what happens with sigma times sigma, and this uh, generates these numbers. You could do this a little more formally instead of just working it out by hand like this each time. If you think of the n alpha beta gamma coefficients as forming a matrix, n alpha with indices beta gamma, then you basically do this kind of calculation by multiplying these matrices together. And if you're interested in how it behaves at large values of little n, you're basically looking for the largest eigenvalue of this matrix, and uh, that's something you can easily calculate. Okay. So for the uh, more general case with general Q, it turns out that we get three times Q uh, of these quasi-particle types in general. They have slightly different uh, charges. The charges are now defined uh, modulo, uh, modulo one, but the, um, the values uh, for the identity, for example, are multiples of one over Q now instead of of one. Um, and uh, sigma is uh, one over, charges one over two Q plus a multiple of one over Q. And so it work, works out then that you get three Q types. But as far as the multiplicities of quasi-whole states are concerned, because the charge sector part that I just described is all abelian, the multiplicities for n quasi-holes work out to be exactly the same form. And finally here, although I'm not talking about Majorana zero modes in these lectures, let me point out here that from this we can make contact with uh, what we get with Majorana zero modes. Um, and uh, in this old paper, we showed that indeed, in a, uh, to my surprise really, that in a BCS, uh, just in BCS theory, it's possible to obtain Majorana zero modes on vortices and on edges. And, uh, and that reason for doing the work was motivated, of course, by this theory. Okay. All right, again, as, be, as yesterday, do uh, ask questions when you, when you want to. So here's a generalization beyond that example. There's a whole series of states that we found. So we can uh, more generally use ZK parafermions instead of a Majorana field. Um, this is sort of a generic case of a simple current that I want, that I can use. So, um, so in this case with ZK, it means that the parafermion field, if I take Psi to be Psi L, Psi 1, and fuse with itself repeatedly, eventually when I get to Psi K, I recover the identity. So we only have K, uh, K distinct uh, um, parafermion operators. Um, now I'll take the particular parafermion theory, which is also the earliest and simplest one, the, what are, the SU2 level K mod U1 parafermions from, from uh, Zamalogikov and Fateyev. In that case, the conformal weights are given by this formula here for k between zero and uh, k, l between zero and k, and the central charge is given by this formula. 
So then we put psi to be psi one in our construction, and we then have to determine the allowed values of new inverse in order to get single valued wave functions. So we find new inverse is m plus two over k, or alternatively, new is k over m k plus two, and m is an integer, a non-negative integer, zero, one, two. Um, so this just takes the place of the capital Q in the previous examples. So this is um, a series of states that in fact includes, for k is one, it includes the Laughlin states, and for k equals two, we have our Fafian state, um, and I should have said that M has to be even if I want to describe bosons and odd if I describe fermions. Um, and interestingly, the chiral algebras that I get in some of these cases are known chiral algebras, um, the, the algebra generated by the field A. So for M is zero, it's SU2 level K, connected with chern simons theory of SU2 level K. And for m equals one, it's the n equals two superconformal algebra. And the conformal field theories are the superconformal minimal models. This is amusing because it means, in fact, since m is one and, <laughs> and k is uh, one, is just the Laughlin state at one third, it means that the new is one third Laughlin state, the earliest quantum Hall state, has a kind of hidden superconformal symmetry built into it. Um, and another interesting example is if I take m is one and k is three, uh, it's possible that this is closely related with what's observed experimentally at 12 fifths. And this case is sometimes referred to as Fibonacci anions. Okay, so now, yeah. Uh, in a sense, yes, yes. Right, well I also said then that fermions are tricky and not strictly local. So um, we really would like to regard the electron in the fermion cases as being kind of the trivial object. In fact, you can also identify it here with the generator of the supercurrent in the chiral algebra. And um, um, so there are things you have to say about the fermion case, and certain things don't go through in this case. In particular, it's not strictly modular. But since I haven't described what I mean by modular, I'm not going to get into this now. Um, um, yeah. <coughs> so, um, it depends on your point of view whether you want to view this fermion operator as being trivial or not. Okay, so, but let's not uh, go really into this. Okay, so now um, the missing thing that I haven't done is I haven't talked about calculating statistics. I haven't done the braiding yet. So now I'm going to describe, I'm going to explain how this is calculated directly from wave functions in the case of the Laughlin states. It's done by Rovers, Schrieffer, and Wilczek. So basically what I want to do is I want to exchange two of these quasi-holes the, along a path which I'll take in the counterclockwise direction. Okay, but I'll start with one quasi-hole, not two. Um, so first, um, some definitions for how to calculate very phase on a parameter space. So suppose that we have a non-degenerate state, psi of s, which depends on a parameter s that go, will go from zero to one, and I'll assume that it's normalized. Um, and so then we let d gamma by ds equal psi in a product d, d psi ds. That's the Berry connection. This is, comes <laughs> from the adiabatic theorem, basically. So this is the definition for the Berry connection. And so the phase picked up after transporting from zero to one, where psi of one equals psi of zero, the phase picked up is just the exponential of i times the integral of d gamma ds. So if you like, d gamma ds is a one form on the parameter space, and I'm just integrating this. Yeah. 
I'm not exchanging them, I have one. Well, in fact, I haven't done anything here. I'm giving a general description about Berry phase. So then it doesn't have to be for a closed path? It does have to be for a closed path because psi of zero equals psi of one. Otherwise, the answer isn't gauge invariant. I can change the phase of my states, psi of s for each s, that's a, what I consider a gauge transformation. If I don't go back to the original uh, s, that zero is equivalent to one, it's not gauge invariant, and so it doesn't mean much. That's why it's got a circle on the integral. So it's a loop in parameter space. So when you exchange them, isn't that open? No. No. Well, we're not even exchanging them yet. OK. So let's now actually do this calculation for one hole in the Laughlin state. So I'm calling the state Laughlin plus W to indicate where the quasar hole is. So it's a good idea to first differentiate the wave function. Since the quasar hole is just a factor product of zi minus sub w, I get minus dw ds sum of one over zi minus w times the same function. And I can, I can write the sum as an integral over a dummy variable of the density of particles over z prime minus w. The density is just a sum of delta functions. Okay, that's the particle number density. So now I have to put the uh, uh, the bra psi on the left and integrate over the particle coordinates to calculate the inner product. However, I also have to remember that this wave function I, that I wrote down is not yet normalized. So I need the normalized state, so I need to divide it by, the, by its norm. So, um, and when I do that under the derivative, I'm gonna pick up terms from the derivative of this denominator but they're very much the same as this term. And so if I put the psi on the left and integrate, you would expect to just get this uh, sort of stuff here in the answer. But once I do this division by the norm, uh, then uh, what happens is I subtract off half of what I have here, and I also subtract off a half of the complex conjugate of it, so that what I actually get is one half of basically what I have here minus the complex conjugate. And finally, I can just say that what I have with the n and the wave functions is just the expectation of n of z prime in the Laughlin quasi hole state. Okay? And so now this d gamma ds is properly real as it should be. Okay? So there was an important step that's not written on the slide. Okay? The next step is I look at the integral over z prime so remember that this is evaluated in the, in the Laughlin state with a hole at W, but I have to integrate over Z prime, and then I've got these factors in this part of the integrand, like one over Z prime minus W, that also depends on Z prime. Now in the Laughlin state, we have uh, screening, and the, apart from the quasi hole, the, the state is homogeneous, so this particle density, whatever else it is, far from the boundary at least, this particle density, um, it has a hole in it at W, but the density profile of the hole is rotation invariant around W. So when I multiply that by one over Z prime minus W, which has angular momentum minus one, if you like, um, it, um, it gives zero. So, so what I'm saying is, and I don't want to, I'm not talking about the entire integral, what I'm really talking about is the difference between using this density and using the density in the Laughlin state with the quasi hole removed. Okay, so I'm talking about the contribution to this from the fact that this is actually calculated in the state with the quasi hole. So that extra dip in density due to the quasi hole is, uh, is localized so that I'm talking about a finite integral that I'm allowed to evaluate separately, but, it, but that finite integral vanishes because of the rotational symmetry. And so then the upshot is that I can actually replace this by the density evaluated in the ground state without the quasi hole. After that step, I can finally integrate over S, and so I now I have this expression where I've now dropped the plus W on the expectation of the density. I'm just using the density in the ground state, and at this point, um, I will do the S or W integral, the integral along the path with the circle on that Victor objected to, um, and I can do that using Cauchy's theorem. And so what I get 
is I only get a contribution from point z prime inside the path. Let's imagine that the path is a, is a simple curve, in other words, a, a non-intersecting, non-self-intersecting closed curve in the counterclockwise direction, then from Cauchy's theorem, I just get the integral of the density on, over the interior of the curve. And this expectation of n is the average number density n bar throughout the droplet. So that's the result in this case. And so this is uh, certainly path dependent because it depends on, depends on the area enclosed by the curve. Okay, any questions? Okay, so this is the path dependent kind of effect that I mentioned earlier. All right. Now we can do a very similar calculation if we have a path that encloses, if we have a second quasi hole and we drag the first one around a path that encloses the second quasi hole. So in that case, we just have to reconsider the density that we were integrating in the last step. Um, my first quasi hole is far from my second one so that my rotation symmetry argument still works thanks to screening and exponential decay of correlations. But now in the, at the ends, there's an additional uh, charge missing from the inside of the contour due to the, uh, the charge of the other quasi hole and that number density is one over Q. And so, the, um, and so the change, there's an additional Berry phase delta gamma, which is two pi over Q, and it's very precisely defined up to exponentially small corrections. Okay. Now finally, I'll make the observation that uh, if I take two quasi holes and exchange them twice, that's equivalent up to isotopy, smooth deformation of curves, making sure they don't intersect. That's equivalent to uh, just taking, keeping one still and moving the other one around the other. So therefore, I'm entitled to divide this Berry connection by, by Berry phase by two and get the statistics phase for an exchange, which is pi over Q. Now, I know I can't always take the square root of a phase factor e to the i gamma without getting a plus or minus sign, but in this case, this is the correct answer. Sorry, can you just say that again? Taking two around each other? So if, I, if I exchange two, you see that's the same as keeping this fixed and the other one goes around it. If it goes all the way around it, that would be the same as the first combination. You must mean to go halfway around it. I'm not making sense. Well, if I... If I do the exchange going halfway around, but I do it twice, that's taking it all the way around. Now to answer, come back to Victor's question again, if I write down, which I don't have on a slide, but if I write down the two quasi hole function, I've got product of zi minus w1, product of zi minus w2, w1 and w2 are interchangeable. So if I move the first w1 so it reaches w2 and the second W2 until it reaches W1, that is exactly the same function that I started with. Okay, so exchanging them is an equivalent state. They are identical, indistinguishable particles. Okay, okay so, uh, so this phase factor is a fractional multiple of uh, pi. If Q is one, I have uh, Fermi statistics. That's correct because Q is one is a free fermion system and the quasi hole is an ordinary hole. Um, and it's easy to generalize to uh, charges little, an integer little q1 times one over q and little q2 and I have to multiply the charges when I do the calculation. Uh, and this means that if q1 and q2 are both equal to big Q, uh, in that case these quasi holes, again, these become equivalent to real holes which are either bosons or fermions, and you see if these are both equal to big Q, this just becomes uh, pi times Q, so that if Q is even, modulo two pi, this, is, um, this means it's a boson, and uh, if Q is odd, it's a fermion. So of course, really, when I look at the statistical phase, um, this is only meaningful modulo uh, two pi. All right, so now let's actually uh, kind of do the same thing again, but look at it in a slightly different way. 
So this is how Halperin, in a paper in 84, wrote the Laughlin, rewrote the Laughlin quasi-hole functions. Now I'll have a whole bunch of quasi-holes. And so here are the factors I just said I hadn't got on a slide. Z, Zi minus Wk and the Laughlin factor. And then he has an additional factor, Wk minus Wl to the power 1 over Q. Okay. And also in the Gaussian part, we've in included an interaction with the background 1 over 4Q. And that sort of corresponds to that um, term I de derived for uh, moving one quasi-hole around because of the background. So quasi-holes behave themselves like charged particles in a magnetic field, and if I put it at different places, I have degenerate states, just like in a Landau level. So this is the function. So really, it's the same functions as before, and all I've done is multiply by this factor at the beginning here. And this doesn't depend on z, so it's the same function, really. It's the same quantum state as before. And the key thing with these functions, which is quite nice, is that these are normalized independently of the values of the w's, of the positions of the quasi-holes, provided they're all well separated from one another. And the reason for that is that now if I look at that uh, Coulomb plasma that I had yesterday, but include these uh, factors, then I have an impurity, if you like, at each W. Some charge is just sitting there, which is a fractional charge of uh, 1 over Q compared with the electrons, the particles. And with this additional term, I've also included the interaction between the impurity charges. So wherever I have a charge, I have corresponding Coulomb interaction. And because of the uh, screening, um, the effect of screening is that everywhere within the, within the droplet, the particle density on the average, smeared over some distance or something, but in fact, the particle density in the statistical average is always zero. So it, it perfectly neutralizes itself. And because of that, the free energy, the, log, the logarithm of the partition function of the plasma partition function is independent of the separation of the quasi-holes. Now, there will be some defect contribution, some small change in the partition in the free energy due to the existence of the quasi-holes or impurities in the plasma, but the point is that as long as they're well separated, it does not depend on the distance. Whereas if I had left out this factor, well, this would have just come outside the calculation and I would have a corresponding log in the free energy if I hadn't put this in the wave function. And so this is a nice way to do these things. That's what he recognized. Laughlin also used this later. Um, another observation about these functions, let's imagine that we rather naively uh, exchange quasi-holes by just looking at the wave function with the particle coordinates fixed and just analytically continue. So if I just analytically continue so that W1 is exchanged with W2 along some path, these factors don't change, as I said just now, but this factor will change, well, if the path doesn't enclose any other particles, if I don't cross any other branch cuts, if you like, this will change by exactly e to the i pi over q, which is exactly the same as in the adiabatic statistics calculation. Okay, so that was sort of how he talked about the fractional statistics. That is, he did it without doing a very phase calculation seemingly. Uh, whoops. Okay. So now uh, I need to make a note about doing very phase calculations using basis states that are not single valued as a function of the parameter uh, when I go around the loop, which is what you, we just saw is what happens with these particular trial functions. In that case, we have to make, at the end, we've sort of come back to the original state, but only up to a gauge transformation. Um, you see the, you see that the, uh, oh, I didn't say this here. You see that by putting this factor in, we've changed the normalization, but we've also multiplied by a phase factor, which is how we got the statistics from continuation, which is not single valued. But nonetheless, it is, in, in some sense, just a gauge transformation, a so-called singular gauge transformation, because it's not, uh, um, continuous as we go around this loop. 
So in that case, if we go around the loop, we have to realize, hey, we're not really back at the original functions. We need to gauge transform back to my original basis states. Otherwise, I'm not allowed to compare because, again, I have to be sure I'm in the same gauge before comparing my answers. Otherwise, I get a gauge artifact. So I have to gauge transform back at the end, and I also have to calculate the exponential of the Berry connection. So in this more general case, the correct gauge invariant Berry phase, also called the holonomy, a really meaningful quantity, B is M times this, uh, in general, um, ignore the P for a second, times the exponential of the uh, Berry, integral of the Berry connection. Okay. So this, um, um, so this gauge transformation that I'm doing at the end can be called the monodromy of the function. That means that when I go around a function, like when I go around a branch cut, it does not come back to the original function, but it changes somehow. That's called monodromy. In this case, it only changes by a phase factor. Another way to think of it is in terms of uh, gauge theory or bundle theory language as a transition function that I come back into my original patch in the original gauge, I have to use the transition function to get back. In, this, in, my, in my picture of this, I have only a single gauge uh, transition function at one point on my, on my loop. So I have to do that there. And the P is path ordering in general all of this generalizes to the case of more than one degenerate state, and then my Berry phase becomes a matrix, a unitary matrix, and so A is a matrix, and to define the exponential of the integral, I need to use path ordering along the uh, curve that's denoted by this, and now I do drop the circle because I have to remember where, where, I, where I started in order to define the path ordering. So now right. you're just writing all of these Ws as functions of some parameter? Um, well, there's only going to be one parameter, which you can still think of as S, once you choose a curve. Well, yeah. You could think of moving all the Ws. It's often simpler to think of just moving only one of them and keeping the others fixed, or maybe two, so we don't get too confused. But in general, I could move them in any way I like as a function of some parameter that just parameterizes the path. So I could, in general, have a path in many, uh, many position space. I'm just having trouble figuring out where, where this connection is defined. Um, okay, so if I want to use these many quasi-whole functions, in general, I'd have C to the little n, where each, because each W is a complex number. And, um, and I could divide by permutations, if you like. And so I have a, I can, in general, I have a, 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 I have a configuration space of quasi-holes and I can define a Berry connection on that space. Yeah. Okay. All right. So this is just a little note about what we have to do if we want to use these kind of non-single valued functions in this style. So as I just said, the, the Halpin functions agree apart from normalization questions, they agree with the original one up to a singular gauge transformation. And so since I'm only changing the gauge and this holonomy like this is constructed so as to be independent even of this kind of transformation, so in this gauge, since we've already got the previous result here, reproduce it here, it must be that in this gauge, the statistics comes entirely from the monodromy and the Berry connection itself vanishes everywhere on the path. Okay? And that's why we get the same result. So there's a nice way to see why that connection vanishes to see it directly. So here's the sort of connection that we, that we have. This is the Berry connection. I've gone back to the non-degenerate case or ignored the degeneracy. And here, here in fact, is the connection on this uh, um, configuration space of the quasi holes and so uh, so the function wave functions depend on the whole set of w's and we take d by dw l to get the different components of the vector potential which is here in complex components so this is the same bit definition as before really except I'm using w itself as the parameter and not s now suppose that the state psi, 
which were already assumed to be normalized or orthonormal in the, in the degenerate case, an orthonormal set in the degenerate case, suppose that they're also holomorphic in W. In that case, the bra psi of W is anti-holomorphic, and that means I can take D by DW off of the last ket and just apply it to the whole inner product, like this. But if I apply it to the inner product, and this is normalized to one, then this derivative vanishes. So that means that under this condition where the psi's are orthonormal and also holomorphic, the Berry connection is identically zero. Okay. So let's look at the Halperin functions again. Are they holomorphic in W? They're not quite holomorphic in W because we had the uh, Gaussian factor in W. But that's a very simple factor. It doesn't depend on the particle coordinates. So that when I'm calculating um, things, it will come outside and not cause any problems. It will give me a very simple dependence. So that in that case, I can, I can generalize this argument. Instead of getting that the connection is zero, I get a very simple expression for the connection that does not depend on the particle density or the other quasiparticles. And that's just the ins that just represents the interaction um, or the Berry phase due to the background, the part, the one I did first for the single quasi-hole case. So the part of the connection that contributes to statistics, the part that's, that's dependent on the other quasi-particles, really does vanish. And so this is all consistent and explains why uh, you're able to get the uh, statistics by reading it off from the monodromy of the trial functions themselves. Okay, is that reasonably clear? This is important. Okay, so this is a key argument. Okay. Now, the Halperin functions that I showed you are exactly what you get from the conformal field theory construction. If I put in several quasi-holes in that construction, I have several of the e to the i phi uh, over root q factors in the uh, correlator. And again, as usual, I have to write the product of difference of coordinates to a power, which is one over q. I get exactly those Halpin functions. I also get the interaction with the, the, interaction with the uh, background gives me the Gaussian in w. So those functions are exactly what we get from the conformal field theory construction. So this led us uh, in our old work, this is the reason that we made somewhat implicitly in the paper, but nonetheless this was the idea, we made this conjecture that when we do the general construction, the statistics of the quasiparticles is given exactly by the monodromy of the functions, that the holonomy the gauge invariant Berry phase I'm supposed to calculate for the exchange or the exchange part of it is just equal to the monodromy of the functions themselves. Okay, so that the, in other words, the statistics part of the Berry connection vanishes. And so in the case of the uh, uh, Fafian functions and so on, um, this, uh, the monodromy in fact is um, is non-trivial and non-abelian. The functions are multi-valued functions and they come back to distinct linearly independent functions so that they come back to distinct states under continuation and we get a non-abelian Berry matrix for the exchange. And that's exactly what you have in conformal field theory. In conformal field theory, you look at the way you think about braiding of um, in correlators and conformal field theory is just by the analytic continuation of the positions of the quasi, of the, sorry, of the, of the prim primary fields. Here we have to do uh, the adiabatic calculation. But according to this idea, it's basically the same, apart from this background effect. Okay. Um, and so from these arguments, we see that it will be sufficient if we can show that the quasi-hole functions are normalized independently of W. We don't have to look at the Berry connection anymore. If we can show that the normalization of those conformal block trial states is independent of the Ws, we'll be done. So the norm square of one of our functions looks like this, because this is one of our functions here in terms of a chiral uh, 
correlator. So this is a mod square of a correlator. The com complex conjugate factor um, has the complex conjugate dependence on the z's and w's. So that means it looks like the left moving part of a conformal field theory. So we can think of this as, because you remember how Robert Digraft explained that in a general non-chiral conformal field theory, you can factorize correlation functions into a chiral and an anti-chiral part, a holomorphic part and an anti-holomorphic part. Here we're putting the pieces back together again. So this is now a correlator in a non-chiral conformal field theory, um, but we also want to integrate over the coordinate z, not w. Well, it, sometimes it's helpful to at least imagine that we can write this thing in a sort of grand canonical way. This would be the canonical ensemble version. This is a grand canonical version in which I have exponential of lambda times a single integral of a bar a. So you see, if I ex so now I've written the angle bracket to mean the non-chiral theory, left and right combined. So now you see that uh, if I expand this exponential to order n, the term lambda to the n just reproduces the multiple integral of correlators that I have here. Okay. So if uh, it's true, as it is usually true in statistical mechanics, that the canonical and grand canonical points of view are equivalent, when in this case n is very large, then this should be exactly the same. Um, in any case, we have some, uh, mm, okay, so we have some operators O and O bar here. We have overall charge neutrality, and charge neutrality itself may just pick out the correct number of particles. But if you write it this way, then this exponential of an integral of some local term just looks like a perturbation in the action of the conformal field theory. What is it? It's lambda a bar times a bar a, and also the O's are exponentials, conveniently, so that's the integral of phi plus phi bar. So this, in a sense, a little bit sloppy, but this, in a sense, is what we're doing. We're taking the conformal field theory, and by putting an exponential, the ex taking the exponential, yeah, taking the expectation of an exponential of something is just equivalent to putting this in the action of the field theory. We also have these other insertions of the quasi of the tau fields. Okay. So what does this perturbation do? Well, suppose that this is a perturbation of the non-chiral conformal field theory. It could cause the theory to flow in the infrared to a massive two-dimensional phase, as perturbations often do when they break conformal invariance. If that's the case, the correlations of local operators, such as tau bar tau, which now more or less become, let's imagine for a second that it can be thought of as a local operator, uh, the correlations of this will become constant, possibly zero, at large separations. Okay. For example, if I took the Ising model, the Ising CFT, and I perturbed it with psi bar psi, which is actually part of my A bar A, that's a mass term. It makes the system massive, and the spin correlation functions become constant at large distances instead of power laws. Well, these the correlators becoming constant at large distances is exactly what I wanted to show, because this, is, this was originally a description of the norm square of a function. I wanted the normalization to be independent of W. So I want this to become independent of the positions of W when they're far apart. So that's exactly what I want. Okay. Now there's a little bit more to deal with, um, in particular in the non-abelian, any non-abelian example, because I have a set of functions and I need to show they're orthonormal. And, um, and, uh, um, and so these products of tau bar tau could either be like in the Ising model an order, a spin field, or, or a disorder field, which was mentioned by Zyberg the other day, something defined using a branch cut. And these things are mutually non-local. And the consequence of that is that uh, they can't simultaneously have expectation values in a massive phase. And so some of the correlations go to zero, 
um, exponentially fast, and what you wind up with is that um, is that you get uh, you get some uh, you get a matrix, you get the identity matrix basically for the matrix. The matrix of inner products becomes the identity matrix. So in other words, instead of just saying the states are normalized, you have a set of states which become orthonormal. In a, in a certain basis, which is the same as the basis used in conformal field theory to construct the, for the experts, the, uh, the diagonal module invariant CFT. Um, yeah, you can go into arguments for that, which I, which I did in this paper in 2009. Um, I don't, I'm not sure I can reproduce it now, in fact. But, you, you know, you, but yes, you do have to, of course, worry about those things, and you have to make the arguments, which I'm, I'm, I'm kind of skipping this part, really, in this lecture. Okay? Okay. So this is, this is the essential point. So this is a generalization of the screening that occurs in the plasma for the Laughlin state. And from this, we obtain most of the properties that describe a modular tensor category for a topological phase. Many of those properties we got for free because the mathematical structures, like fusion and so on, are already present in the conformal field theory. So when we use the conformal field theory to make the wave functions, we automatically satisfy a whole bunch of consistency conditions. The thing that we don't get for free is we don't get adiabatic transport of quasi-particles um, in that picture, we have monodromy. So the, the part that we have to show in detail is that, in fact, that gives us the same effect as the monodromy in the conformal blocks, which I've, which I've just argued under this hypothesis, which I refer to as generalized screening hypothesis. There may be questions about quasi-particle spin, which I left open in this paper and talked about in the same year, but um, we're still having discussions about the meaning of that, as you saw yesterday. Um, that may be slightly open. So then the question is, does this hypothesis that I used actually hold in our wave functions? Or maybe it holds in some of these wave functions, not in others, corresponding to different topological phases or, not, or things that are not topological at all. Um, so various kinds of numerical evidence suggests, for one thing, that it does hold in the simplest, in the simple cases that we can investigate. And some particular work I want to mention here is Bonderson, Girari, and Nayak, who did uh, similar, following my work, similar, um, similar arguments, but using an additional mapping, which can be used in some of the conformal field theories. So in some cases, this is fine, but there's an important caveat. If the conformal field theory is non-unitary, what you get under the hypothesis is inconsistent with uh, some consequences of unitarity in the 2 plus 1 theory. So, uh, so if we assume the structure of a modular tensor category, there's an important extension of the basic structure due to Turayev, who introduced what he calls a unitary modular tensor category. And what does he mean by unitary? He means that he wants to include in the, in the description the consequences of uh, positivity in the quantum mechanical Hilbert space in the 2 plus 1 system. I mean, he, he explicitly wanted it to be just like quantum mechanics. So he built this into uh, some, some additional conditions on the data in the modular tensor category. Okay? And so many of the familiar ones that we hear about are, of course, unitary. The Chern-Simons theories for compact gauge groups and... Um, and many other examples, the toric code, and, and many things that have been discussed here. Uh, I would hazard the guess that probably all the ones that have been mentioned are unitary. Okay. Um, okay. Now, you may say, oh, well, you said it's not unitary here, so that means it's not unitary here. But when I say non-unitary in conformal field theory, I'm talking about unitarity in a one plus one point of view in the conformal field theory. And it's not clear if I'm using this Euclidean construction, what on earth that construction has to do with the wave functions, what on earth does that have to do with positivity of the inner product on Hilbert space in the two plus one point of view? It's not at all obvious that these are even connected. 
And if you write down wave functions that you get from non-unitary CFTs in this way, they look perfectly reasonable. They're okay looking functions. What could possibly go wrong? Well, in fact, something, uh, seem, some things seem to go wrong. Uh, what goes wrong is that, um, so first of all, it seems like in every example of a rational but non-unitary conformal field theory, there's always a, no a negative conformal weight in the theory. And the consequence of that is that the, and getting into technical things a bit, but the modular S matrix, the, the row and column can corresponding to the identity uh, contain negative entries. And now those entries up to normalization, those entries are known as the quantum dimensions of the tensor category. And in the unitary modular tensor category, they have to be all positive. And so, but on the other hand, by using these arguments, it seems that we inevitably end up with a modular tensor category that then fails to be unitary in this way, according to um, the, the, uh, the belief that a non-unitary rational CFT always contains a negative <coughs> scaling dimension. Doesn't seem to be any proof of that but it seems to be an empirical fact. And there are other arguments that say that if the conformal field theory is non-unitary, this is going bad. Another one is based on the structure of the edge theory. The edge theory is supposed to be more or less conformal, but it certainly exists within positive uh, inner product, ordinary Hilbert space, <coughs> uh, quantum mechanics um, on the edge. So the conformal field theory on the edge cannot possibly be a non-unitary conformal field theory. So then you have a big problem because you would certainly like to believe, as we suggested in our old paper, that the conformal field theory that you use for the bulk construction is the same one that describes the edge theory. And so again, you run into inconsistencies using this. And there are some similar or maybe simpler inconsistencies if the theory is rational, it could be unitary but not rational, and then there are, there are again difficulties. And so what happens is that in this case, the hypothesis leads to what seem to be self-contradictory results, so therefore the hypothesis should fail, the generalized screening should break down, and um, a year or two ago, there was a bunch of papers that came out all within a couple of weeks by about four different groups in which they directly studied this question in connection with some examples of these non-unitary examples and uh, conclude that the screening seems to break down. And so in these cases, um, even when we have a uh, special Hamiltonian for which the wave functions we construct are the are exact zero energy eigenstates, it seems there must not be a gap in the bulk excitation spectrum. questions about this. All right. Um, so I'm nearly at the end of this, what was perhaps meant to be lecture one. Um, I thought I should add something about quantum computation here at the topological quantum computation because it's closely connected with all of these things. Uh, so this uh, first, let's just think about ordinary uh, or general quantum computation. So in quantum computation, we want to be able to perform operations on a quantum system so that we start from some initial state and we do some operations and we reach some desired quantum state. And then we usually, um, so we usually do that as a unitary evolution and then we uh, read out from the final state by doing some measurements. There are some other schemes that don't quite fit this description, but let's uh, ignore those. Yeah. Um, no, not when they're close together. I mean, you get into too many. It's, these are, you know, s not trivial functions, and it seems to be not possible. I mean, maybe there are methods, but I don't know them. I mean, sometimes, sometimes correlation functions can be calculated exactly because of some integrability in the theory and things like that. But I think for these examples, I don't know of any way of calculating it. 
All right. <clears throat> okay, so with this um, general idea of quantum computation, so what do we need? So we, we usually want to use only a simple set of operations or gates, which we apply in a sequence, and these operations, uh, we should be able to closely approximate any desired operation or unitary uh, operator uh, we should be able to approximate. So that, that would be what we call a universal set of gate operations. And then there's uh, the danger of decoherence of the quantum state during our experimental evolution due to coupling to noise. So this produces errors. In the usual circuit model, what we have is a, the system is a collection of two-state systems or qubits, a tensor product space, and the gate operations act on only one or two qubits at a time. And, and this is enough to give you a universal set. But this is quite susceptible to errors. And in practice, um, we would expect we would have to use a, a, a large number of additional qubits which can be used to provide redundant storage of information and correct for errors. And that's feasible in practice if the error rate is not too big, but of course it's still a, a big burden, um, uh, practically speaking. So the idea of the of topological quantum computation, which was introduced by Kitaev and, and Friedman and co, is that our si we take our system to be a topological phase of matter and we focus on the low energy states, which are degenerate states of some non-abelian quasi-particles, well separated. And if we perform ex adiabatic exchanges of quasi-particles, that performs a unitary operation on the states. And the advantage of this, which I already mentioned yesterday, is that these degenerate states are in principle uh, exponentially well decoupled from external sources of noise. The disadvantage of this, there are several perhaps, one is that we have yet to demonstrate the existence of non-abelian quasi-particles. <laughs> um, we haven't demonstrated the braiding. Manipulation of them may be difficult. And of course, other approaches for quantum computation that already exist are much further advanced than, than this because of these reasons. Okay, so some of my colleagues think this is at Yale, think this is a strange idea because they're busy working on gates but, uh, and circuits, but uh, I'm going to have some faith in it nonetheless. Yeah. Given that this is a gate, if you have that extra gap, then that'll contribute in another phase. It contributes only phases, yes. Yeah, so those phases, uh, like, you, those phases are path dependent. Yeah, but you need to, I mean, that, that, so you don't get a topological. That's not, that part is not really topological. That's a very good point. Protected. So the phase is not protected. Or it's not. Um, uh, it's not robust. Or right, um, but it doesn't matter. So you can show that it's that it's it's the idea still works. So when you have non-abelian, you have this extra phase, but all the states get the same extra phase. Yes, so it's that's right. Bad. Exactly. Yes. Okay. And so, um, yeah. And so then you tend to start talking about the operations unitary operations modulo the phase factors, and not just as matrices. All right, so that's a short uh, description about, oh, I haven't finished. <laughs> okay, so some topological phases provide non-abelian quasi-particles that can be used for universal quantum computation. In other words, the exchange operations give you a big enough gate set that you can do the computation, and this includes our parafermion states provided k is not equal to one or two or four. So not a Laughlin state, that's abelian, so that's uh, useless. And not a more read state, that's k is two. And also not k equals four. But the other cases are universal. So the k equals three that I mentioned in relation to the 12 fifth state actually would be universal for quantum computation. Um, and furthermore, then, under, under these conditions, the, the topological model has the, the same computational power as the circuit model. Okay. And so the uh, very popular, currently very popular Majorana zero mode things 
um, although very interesting, do not on their own provide universal quantum computation and actually may be subject to other issues and problems that are not present in my, in my topological phases of matter uh, generally. So they would have to be supplemented somehow in order to be used. Okay, so that is the end of this lecture, or that lecture. And now my plan is to continue with some slightly different material here. So I'm going to shift gears a bit, but I'm still going to be talking about fractional quantum hall, and I'm still going to be talking about using the conformal field theory construction, so the methods are very much the same. And in fact, if I, if I actually get through the material that I have planned, you'll see that this generalized screening hypothesis that I used a few minutes back is also useful for making a number of other arguments as well. So we'll focus a bit more on transports. We'll still have some very phase calculations. Um, here's a plan. So I'm going to talk about Hall conductivity, Hall viscosity, and thermal Hall conductivity, and also things like gravitational churn Simons will appear. So first, uh, a little, uh, perhaps I hope simple, uh, review about Hall conductivity as a churn number or Berry curvature, and I think this was discussed in the first week quite a bit. But here's a sort of refresher. So we'll imagine that we have a system of particles in a ground state with an energy gap. We have a topological phase of matter, and we have char they're charged particles. We can apply a vector potential, a mu, an external vector potential. Um, and let's suppose that we just apply a uniform vector potential uh, choosing a gauge, of course, and we'll let it vary slowly in time. Since E is minus dA dt, this means we're applying a weak electric field. So we have an electric field in some direction. And we'll think of our system as being uh, maybe a square with periodic boundary conditions. And in a sense, if we do this and we introduce a uniform vector potential, we can make again a singular gauge transformation, remove the vector potential, at the expense of changing the boundary conditions, twisting the boundary conditions. But I'll actually, want, I'll actually continue with the vector potential and fix the boundary conditions to be, let's say, periodic in some sense. So the low frequency current response can be obtained from a Berry phase calculation. So in relation to the adiabatic theorem, um, we can express the conductivity as a Berry curvature this time. So we have the same Berry connection, and now with the parameters that I'm varying, instead of the quasi-particle positions, which I don't have, it's the two components of the vector, the uniform vector potential are what I'm going to vary adiabatically and define the Berry connection, curly A, to, be, to involve derivatives with respect to straight A. And so this is a Berry connection on the space of constant A's. Space of constant A's is just like a plane, if you like. So in that plane, I can define the curl or curvature, dA by dA. Um, alternatively, I could think of a Berry phase as I go around a loop in straight A space and integrate the one form curly A mu. I guess the notation is horrible, but let's bear with it. And, well, so that's one way to do it. The other way to do it is I could use Stokes' theorem in the A space, and I could express this as the integral over the interior of my curve of the Berry curvature by Stokes' theorem. But either way, it can be shown that the conduct whole conductivity is essentially this Berry curvature over L squared, if I have my normalizations correct. And it can be shown also that this is essentially equivalent to the use of the Kubo formula. And this is a general relation. This kind of thing applies to other response functions. There's generally an anti-symmetric or Hall-like part which can be written as a Berry curvature and, um, and this curvature is, is uh, what shows up as the response function. And this is 
therefore, transport coefficient. Yes? The what? The oh, well, I'm going to talk about that. So, um, all right. I, so let me just continue a little before talking about that. So here I've, I've put a slide where I'm going to say a bit more about how this re response actually arises. Um, so suppose we have a Hamiltonian, which depends on some parameters. Now I'm going to call them lambda. Just a bunch of parameters, lambda mu. Mu runs from 1 to n. It may not be the same mu I had just now. Just a general example. And suppose that minus dh by d lambda mu is some kind of current operator. And I'm interested in the response of this operator to some perturbation by some of the, mu some of the lambdas. In fact, I have a whole set of these and a whole set of parameters, so I have a matrix of responses. And let me, for simplicity, imagine that the Hamiltonian annihilates the ground state to get rid of what are called persistent currents. That's just a simplification I can make. And H is gapped. And I'll imagine that it's a non-degenerate ground state um, for, each, uh, for each lambda. So then what you can show using the quantum adiabatic theorem is that the expectation of this current operator in the presence of a time-varying lambda is given by this formula, which contains, oh, I'm sorry, this should be the curly F. This is the Berry curvature, okay? So the response of the current to the time derivative of the parameter is, in, because there's a gap, given purely by this off-diagonal matrix, anti-symmetric matrix, which is the Berry curvature, as defined again here. Yes, the, and here I'm just assuming it's a non-degenerate ground state. Yes, 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 yes. I mean, I think there are generalizations of this for density matrices if you want to have non-zero temperature. Okay, so this is the general setup, and um, Avron and Seiler, who I mentioned, um, showed that you can get whole conductivity that way, and that's this reformulation of the Kubo formula that I mentioned on the last slide. Um, oh, I think I meant to remove that part at the bottom, sorry. <laughs> Come back to that kind of thing. So as I said here, this is a general relation. Um, ah, yes, and the Kubo formula, so the Kubo formula is usually written in a way that involves a sum over all excited states. So that, if you use that, that may be hard to calculate. But it may be easier to calculate this Berry curvature because you just have to take the ground state for each value of the parameter and then just uh, compute the Berry curvature. So you don't, need a, you don't need to think about excited states. Of course, really, it's the same, and so it's all there implicitly, but it looks like a kind of easier way to calculate. And it turns out to be quite fruitful in some situations. Uh, okay. So now the question about integration and quantization. So in this um, Hall conductivity case, the space of A's that I want to consider, the vector, uniform vector potentials, really live on a torus due to the fact that if I uh, change the um, yeah, line integral of A around a cycle of the torus, if I change that, that's the flux through one of the holes on the torus, if I change that by 2 pi, that's really equivalent to the original system. So what we're talking about is we have a, a, a torus of distinct uh, boundary conditions, or A's, if you like. We have a bundle over that, over that, a bundle of ground states. We have a Berry curvature in that U1 bundle. And if I integrate that over this torus, properly normalized, I get the, the churn number C1 of T. So this is necessarily an integer. And this is 2 pi times the Hall conductivity. Um, and that's the correct units for Hall conductivity if I have um, uh, h bar equals 1 and e is 1. This is the correct units. Well, here I call this sigma xy with a bar because what I've really done, coming back to your question, is I've taken my Hall conductivity that I had before and I've averaged it over a. Um, if I put the 2 pi down here, it's really an average over the torus. So that's basically averaging it. And that's the thing that you can show with this argument is necessarily quantized. But in many situations, you would expect 
especially if you don't have disorder, you would expect that if I just evaluate the Berry curvature at some particular A, that it doesn't depend on A, the straight A, and therefore I don't have to do the average. Okay. And that's what Thaulus, Komoto, and then Nyes and Nightingale did. They sh really have to be mentioned as pioneering this and discovering this relation between the Hall conductivity in some filled band and a churn number associated with the band. It was very important work in about 1980. Okay, so that was Hall conductivity. Now I'm going to switch to a different transport property. This time it's viscosity. So viscosity is concerned with transport of momentum. So it doesn't really make much sense to talk about viscosity unless you have quantization, um, sorry, conservation of momentum. You need continuous translation invariance. And the momentum density I'll call G of X. It's defined by something like this. Pi could be, would be the kinetic momentum of particles that includes, that's P minus A if I have a vector potential. So the current for momentum is the stress tensor, which I'm going to call tau. Uh, so I'm changing the meaning of the symbol tau. So this, if you like, is the momentum flux, and the momentum density obeys a continuity equation together with the stress tensor. And if I have a magnetic field, as I usually like to have, then I have a Lorentz force term on the right-hand side. So the momentum is not quite conserved, but if I have a uniform magnetic field, this just gives rise to a precession, a Larmor precession of momentum around, um, around, the, uh, around the magnetic field axis. Okay. Now, this, if I have a metric in space, not necessarily space-time, but if I have a metric in space, this couples to the stress. It plays the role like the vector potential, varying the Hamiltonian with the vector potential gives me the current, varying with the metric gives me the stress, like this here. So it's sort of geometric. And if I have non-interacting particles, my Hamiltonian is just kinetic energy, and here I have the inverse metric, and I have to be careful of a minus sign, which I once forgot about by mistake. Um, and um, so from this, you can calculate the stress tensor uh, associated with the system. Okay. And so then if I look at the response of the expectation of stress to another change in metric, that's like response of current to vector potential, that gave conductivity, this gives viscosity. And there's a Kubo formula for this. All right, now let's talk about viscosity a bit more. In general, viscosity is a fourth rank tensor. Uh, if we take the expectation of the stress in some state of matter or in a fluid, like in some old textbooks you can easily find, um, then you, you usually think about it phenomenologically. Uh, for a solid, for example, the stress in the solid is related to the static strains, U, by some elastic coefficients, which I call lambda here. And it's related to the first de time derivatives of the strains by the viscosity tensor. And then we would have further terms that would be uh, higher time derivatives. And here I'll imagine that everything is uniform in space. Okay. Then if we have rotation invariance in space, then we can analyze this further. And this is done in some of these references. Um, and tau is symmetric when we have rotation invariance. And, uh, um, and the, the further point is that the uh, strain uh, matrix U can be replaced by derivatives of the velocity. The time derivative of U can be replaced by derivatives of velocity. So in a, in a fluid, what you usually see is uh, something where the viscosity multiplies the gradients of velocity. Okay. And so in the Kubo point of view, calculating viscosity uh, is done by, um, by using a time-dependent metric to get the stress-stress response. Okay. And let's skip a little here. But the symmetry analysis of the, uh, 
viscosity tensor, we can split it into parts that are either symmetric or anti-symmetric under exchange of the first two with the last two indices. And um, at least at zero frequency, only the symmetric part gives the dissipation. <laughs> if it's rotation invariant, this reduces to the familiar viscosities, the shear viscosity uh, eta and the possibly less familiar bulk viscosity zeta. And the anti-symmetric part is often forgotten about because in the references because uh, it disappears if time reversal is a symmetry. If time reversal is broken, it can appear and it's the non-dissipative part. It does not contribute to dissipation because the dissipation I'm talking about here involves this quadratic form and so the anti-symmetric part drops out. Um, and with rotation symmetry, the whole viscosity in two dimensions, there's a unique possible in rotation invariant tensor and I can use this then to define the single number that I call the whole viscosity. And so now it's possible to think of varying the metric adiabatically in a, in a system with a gapped ground state to obtain the whole viscosity response. And this was done in a paper by Avron, Silo, and Zograf 20 years ago. They did it for the case of a filled lambda level. Um, recently, a few years back, I obtained results for a larger class of things two types of things. One is paired superfluids, such as P plus IP paired states. The other is trial quantum Hall states, and uh, a little less, a little more heuristically for even for other kinds of states. And remarkably, what happens is there's a universal formula for this Hall viscosity in the rotation invariant situation. It's equal to a half N bar, S bar, H bar. H bar is Planck's constant. And N bar is the density of particles in my system. And S bar is something that you can think of as, an, as minus the orbital spin per particle in the fluid. So for example, in practice, if you have a paired state like P plus IP, the angular momentum of the Cooper pair, well, each, angular, each Cooper pair has an angular momentum, so half of that is associated with each particle and taking minus that gives me the value of S bar for the P plus IP or other paired states. So it's very simple to understand the appearance of the spin per particle in that case. Um, in the conformal block states, it's given simply by the conformal weight or what's called spin in, in conformal field theory of the particle field A that's used in the construction. Um, which means, for example, in the Laughlin one-third state, it's equal to three halves, as I mentioned here. And the Avron et al. result is sort of equivalent to the special case of the filled lambda level, and that is equivalent to saying S bar is one half. Now, this quantity S bar is also related to the shift that appears on the sphere. If you put a ground state of a quantum Hall system on a sphere, you need to pick the for a given number of particles, you have to pick the magnetic uh, flux coming out of the sphere appropriately in order to get a ground state that has no defects in it, no quasi-particles forced into it. And on a sphere, that involves a, a shift that the n phi is reduced by, my, by s compared with the naive result, nu inverse n. And so Wen and Z argued that the shift is twice some orbital spin per particle, S bar. And the reason is that spin couples in, a, in the presence of curvature, sp spin, if a particle has spin, it sees the curvature of the space it's on as being a kind of magnetic flux, similar to a magnetic flux. So if we sort of include that effect, then we get a, a different uh, effective magnetic field. And so the remarkable thing is that the S bar that ap now apparently appears in the whole viscosity is the same one that appears in the shift. In each case, including the paired superfluids. All right. So let me start to try to give you idea, an idea of why this universal result for the whole viscosity should hold. 
What on earth does whole viscosity, or what does viscosity have to do with spin? How can it have to do with anything to do with spin? So, um, so this is the heuristic version, which can be made more rigorous. Um, so in two dimensions, there are two independent shears that we can make if we want to preserve area. They're basically quadrupolar deformations. So one of them is that we stretch one way and squash the other. And the other is we do the same thing along the axes rotated by 45 degrees. So these are the only two independent shears. So shear is related to a symmetric rank two tensor and we don't care about the trace. And so this is the quadrupolar thing and there are only two independent ones. Now these are two operations which don't commute. So suppose that I take my square and I, un I make these moves and I undo them in reverse order. Okay, so first I do the first operation, I get a rectangle. Now I stretch that along the, the original 45 degree angles. I get something like this. Um, now I'm going to undo the first, first operation. Undoing this one will be silly, I'm just going backwards. So I'll undo the first operation. I get something like this. I undo the second operation, I get something like this. And so what's happened is I've come back to, these are supposed to be thought of as small shears, by the way, exaggerated for the sake of the picture. I come back to the original shape, but it's now been rotated by some angle. Okay. So the, the group theoretic commutator of two shear operations gives a rotation, um, if they're infinitesimal. Here's that in equations. The Transformations can be described by SL2R matrices. That is, uh, they have the effect on the coordinates of multiplying by a real matrix, linear mapping. To be area preserving, I need this to, be, to have determinant one. This defines, uh, A is invertible, so this defines the group uh, SL2R in two dimensions. There are two symmetric such matrices which I'll take close to the identity. These are infinitesimal shears. This one is the, uh, the one that gets, makes the rectangle. This one is the one acting along the 45 degree axes. If I apply the first one on the right, and then the second, then invert the first, invert the second, what I get is the identity plus something of order epsilon times epsilon prime. And if I had done this um, in terms of the Lie algebra instead, this would just come from the commutator of the infinitesimal parts here. Um, and this final result you see up to this order, this is anti-symmetric, which means that it corresponds to a small rotation. Okay, so the commutator of two shears is a rotation. So now suppose that I apply these operations to some quantum mechanical state, and suppose the state has some angular momentum. Well, in the end I rotate it, if it's an angular momentum eigenstate, that means it picks up a phase factor in the exponent. What I get is the rotation angle times the spin. Now, when I do a Berry phase calculation for, for this um, operation, basically I'm going to, to get the Berry phase around a loop. Well, here's my loop. I go around this loop, something like this, and I want to calculate the Berry phase. So the Berry phase, the Berry curvature, is, comes out to be proportional to the spin, spin density. Uh, well, it turns out to be proportional to the total spin, and for whole viscosity, I have to divide by the volume of the system, so I get the spin density. Okay. All right. And so the, um, so this is a heuristic picture, but quite informative. And, uh, all right. and so, as long as rotation invariance is preserved, S-bar is robust against perturbations of the Hamiltonian. <laughs> in this case, you don't get this from a churn number argument. The reason is that the space of shapes is not compact. Um, and uh, so you can't use the argument that it's a churn number, but you can use some other arguments. I think I will probably just skip the rest of this for lack of time. Okay. So now I want to say something about uh, effective field theory methods in relation to this. Um, okay. 
So I'm going to take a point of view that I can think about even a non-relativistic system in a general space-time. But it's not going to, it's, I'm not going to have any Lorentz invariance in my space-time or even Galilean invariance. But what I want to have so that I can incorporate the symmetries of ordinary non-relativistic uh, matter, there's some things I do need to have. What I should have at each point is I should have, I should know what the time direction is because that's, that's fixed. I'm not talking about Galilean invariance. So I have a fixed time direction. And then I have some space directions. And I also have one forms, the, the dual objects as well. Um, and so I have these, I have some, uh, some what I call field binds. So this is a frame. So at each point in space time, I can define a frame of uh, vectors. One of them is the time direction. Then I have two space-like vectors, if you like. Um, and the choice of those is arbitrary up to a rotation in the, among the two uh, space-like ones. And similarly for the, for the one form. So I know what are the time and what are the space directions. And I also have a spatial metric, the one I've referred to before, which I can think of in terms of these frames using a standard metric in the frame space, the sort of internal space, A to AB. A and B run from one to two, unlike the alpha and mu indices, which run from zero to two. And the, uh, um, so the, the space-like one forms are used to form this metric. So I have a metric for space, but it's a degenerate metric in space-time because it, doesn't, it, uh, it annihilates the uh, time-like vector. Okay. So this is the basis for the geometry that I can use, and it's really very general. You see, I don't have to say anything about the topology of space-time. I don't have to say space-time is some manifold cross R. I can, I can, in principle, do this in a very general setting. Now, in Lassinger's old work, he was studying thermal conductivity, and that's basically you using the zero, zero component of the field bind as what he calls uh, one plus his psi. So looking at response to this is how he did uh, thermal conductivity. But in this framework, using all of the components, we can, we can, we can study uh, various different transport phenomena. And again, I'm interested in doing this in a topological phase. And because the space-like directions are kind of arbitrary, there's an arbitrary choice here. I have some gauge invariance on the internal indices that I can rotate between them. And there's a corresponding uh, SO2 uh, connection, omega, which is the spin connection, um, which I can think of as existing for all the indices, but the only non-zero components are the space-space internal components. And the background geometry can have both curvature and torsion. And so the idea is that we want to consider some matter system with a gap. We want to integrate out the matter to get the, what I will call the induced action. When I integrate out all of the matter fields, what I get is an action that depends only on the background fields. I call that the induced action. And for a gap system, huh, what I say here is that this induced action is local in the background fields in the bulk um, and completely invariant. Well, there are some uh, restrictions on that, actually. It's not quite correct, as was pointed out last week by Edward, in particular. Um, uh, um, however, he's, uh, as well as saying things aren't gauge invariant and so on, he also said, well, if you want to calculate local responses, then it's okay to do this, and we can use this point of view. And that's actually what I'm going to be doing. So I'm not really going to be looking at the global aspects, which can be troubling. All right. And, um, and because I have a kind of gauge invariance, I have coordinate transformation invariance, I have internal rotations, I'm also going to put in a U1 vector field. This allows me to look at, um, well, it, this corresponds to symmetries of translations in space and, and rotations in space and the U1 or particle number conservation. And these are all related to conservation laws, conservation of energy, momentum, angular momentum, and particle number. And so I can consider transport of all of these by uh, looking at response of the system to these background fields. In a, in a sort of a unified framework for doing the whole thing. 
So the induced action that I get is a generating function that describes all of these responses of the system to the background fields. And after I take, various, uh, take the response or the functional derivatives, I can even just pass to the limit of a trivial flat space time. And the fact that I may consider a curved space time earlier is just a, a, a calculational device. And so then I can use, I can study various general responses. So what kind of terms can I get in my induced action? Well, we can distinguish two kinds of terms. One is the locally invariant terms. The locally invariant terms are integrals of some uh, completely invariant uh, local expressions in the background fields. They're invariant under all uh, types of gauge or coordinate transformations. The other terms uh, are essentially what I call Chern-Simons-like terms. These are the more interesting ones. And the possible ones are written here. The first line, well, the first term is this uh, Chern-Simons that describes the uh, Hall conductivity. The next two terms appeared in a paper by Wen and Z in 1992. And the last term is the gravitational Chern-Simons term, which, uh, uh, well, in this old paper, I, I guess I pointed out that you should generally expect to have this in the quantum Hall system. Here, gamma is the Christoffel uh, connection. I'm not quite sure the right name, but um, because in general I might allow torsion in my space time. But anyway, so this is connected with diffeomorphism invariance. And here the coefficient c is the so called topological uh, mm, central charge, or that's what we're expecting anyway. And the other coefficients are anticipating things a bit. I'm calling this one s bar and this one s squared bar. There's also a new outside. S bar will turn out to be the same S bar that I had earlier. Now the point about these terms is that these are not completely gauge invariant. If I look under the integral, it's not gauge invariant. Oh my. But it turns out that um, if you work it out, in each case, each of these separately, and then this one term here, the transformation under an appropriate gauge transformation is either trivial or it's a total derivative. So it may give you something on the boundary, but that's all. And so these, are, these have the property that they're invariant, not completely invariant for at least one type of gauge transformation. Now there's an argument that these kinds of coefficients must be robust against perturbations of the Hamiltonian provided we don't cross a phase boundary in which case you remember that a gap may, uh, the bulk energy gap may collapse. Um, and the reason for that is that um, if I could, um, how should I do this? so first of all, suppose that if I can perturb the Hamiltonian and change some coefficients in the induced action, well, if I can perturb the Hamiltonian, I can do it differently in different places in space, maybe smoothly varying. In that case, coefficients that I obtain in the induced action could become position dependent, right? Normally, for, for the fully locally invariant terms, that's perfectly okay. There's no problem with that. But for the Chern-Simons terms, if I put the coefficients under the integral and then let them become position dependent, the term is just not, it's no longer gauge invariance up to boundary terms. Okay. The only way to make it invariant would be to somehow have some sort of internal boundaries of the system which can be used to compensate for that. And as long as that's not happening, which is supposed to be the case, it means that the coefficients of these terms must be independent of position. But if they're independent of position, they can't be changed under a position dependent perturbation of my Hamiltonian. So basically that means that under a perturbation of the Hamiltonian, they can't change at all. So this is a very slick argument for why these coefficients, such as the Hall conductivity, are topological invariants that cannot be changed by changing the Hamiltonian unless the gap collapses. I think I learned this from field theorists originally, this argument. Okay. And I should, maybe I should mention that the, in my particular geometry, this second Wen Z term is actually equivalent 
to the gravitational Chern-Simons term uh, up to a boundary term. And by the way, there are discussions of related things in, in a number of recent papers. Some of the people are here. All right, I'm running a bit over time. I, I should probably postpone the end of this discussion for next lecture. Uh, Unless, uh, uh, I'm not sure. Let me just see how many slides I actually have left. Okay, yeah. Uh, I'm not sure. I should, I know. <laughs> uh, no, I'm not going to rush, but there's actually not so much on the next couple of slides. So, all right. And so I'll soon arrive at some nice punchlines and we'll be done. Okay, so, uh, so the thing is that the Chern Simons uh, induced action actually determines Berry curvature. I haven't done this explicitly here. But if we look back at it and we put things in, you see we have first, it's first order in, time de in, in derivatives, the explicit derivatives of first order, and in particular there are time derivatives. So this kind of first order term, this should remind you of things like uh, PQ dot in classical mechanics. And these terms are related to Berry curvature. Okay, and at some point we heard something about such curvature in phase space in connection with quantizing, I don't know, this and that, including Chern-Simons. So basically, you can easily show that the Chern-Simons terms, if you pick out the time derivative terms, for example, with a uniform vector potential here in this term, you can recover the Hall conductivity. So this coefficient of this term is physically realized as a Hall conductivity through this Berry curvature uh, argument that I mentioned earlier. And so the same is true for the, more or less, for the other terms. So in particular, the Hall viscosity can be obtained from the first Wen Z term, the one with coefficient S bar. And this gives one nice way to show that this Hall viscosity is uh, robust against perturbations. I should add that in, in writing my effective action, I've made use of the assumption that I have rotation invariance in space. And that's the conditions under which it's robust. Um, oh, there's a little bit here. Okay. All right. And so then we get exactly the same result. So from the Wen Z term, we get exactly the whole viscosity. Um, oh, so I have a bit of a story about thermal hall conductivity. Um, let me try to cut things short. So the thermal hall conductivity involves the topological central charge, the right-moving minus left-moving central charge of the edge theory. And this is supposed to be an invariant under perturbations. And this is really an edge effect, and one can show it's really an edge effect. But this C is the same as the coefficient of the gravitational Chern-Simons term because of anomaly inflow arguments, at least in the relativistic setting, and perhaps we have to do more work in checking this in the non-relativistic case, but this is what is supposed to happen. Okay. Now, when I look at the bulk action, I can't actually get the thermal Hall conductivity from the bulk. Unlike the Hall conductivity, the thermal Hall conductivity cannot be alternatively expressed purely as a bulk response. At least not in, uh, not in a really meaningful way as a local response. However, there could still be some bulk effect that is connected with this thermal Hall conductivity, or in other words, with the central charge. And the gravitational Chern-Simons term is the way that that takes place. So one can look at a spatially varying uh, metric and look at the very curvature as we vary the strength of this spatially varying uh, metric perturbation. And one might do it with A plus S bar omega held fixed for convenience. And uh, so here's where I'm skipping a somewhat lengthy technical part. Um, let me just say that when we do this for conformal block states, uh, what happens is that it boils down to 
um, a gravitational anomaly in the chiral conformal field theory. Or in other words, it boils down to the central charge term in the stress-stress uh, um, operator product in the conformal field theory. Now, it's completely parallel to something you can also show for the Hall conductivity. And so we get the same, here the topological central charge is purely uh, from right movers on the edge, and it's the same as the central charge of the CFT I used in the bulk. Okay. And I think with this I will basically conclude. Though one can go into other fine points, but I think in the interest of time, I won't do that. And then I'll refer you to, to the actual papers with my student, former student, Barry Bradlin, uh, if you're really interested in more. Thanks.